Good morning, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club. I'm Dr. Karen Philbrick, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. Our mission is to improve mobility for all by creating a transportation system that is convenient, safe, efficient, and accessible. We create a connected world through research, education, and technology transfer, and we're so pleased that you could join us today. Thank you. Now, before I get started, I would like to welcome a few special guests. First, we have Supervisor Cindy Chavez in attendance, a champion of housing and transportation. Thank you, Cindy, for being with us. We are honored with the presence of MTI trustee, Ms. Rose Gilbo. Thank you. And I have a few more names, all are worthy of applause, but if we could just hold our applause, I would be appreciative. <laughs> Next, I would like to say thank you to the Honorable Rod Diridon, founding executive director of the Mineta Transportation, for his presence. All right, all right, let's give that applause, all right. We always have time for some feel-good energy. I'd also like to welcome Michael Hirsch, general manager of AC Transit. <clears throat> Mark Nakayama, General Manager and CEO of the Washington, D.C. office for JR Central. Mark, thank you. And we also have the presence of Bijan Sardipi, the former Caltrans 4 District Director. Bijan, great to see you. Now, please take a moment to make sure that your cell phones, PDAs, all noise-making devices are turned to silent. This is critically important because this is a broadcast that will be on radio and will be available for later video download. Now, on to today's program, which is sponsored by the Mineta Transportation Institute. Uh, but before we begin, let me tell you about three exciting upcoming programs. On June 24th, CNN Chief Diplomatic Officer John Shuto. On June 26, the CIA's former Chief of Disguise, Jonah Mendez, talking about spy tactics that won the Cold War. And on July 10th, and I think this is one we should all tune in for, educator Esther Wojcicki, whose daughters are respectively the CEO of YouTube and 23andMe, talking about how to raise successful adults. <laughs> I think I'm gonna tune in, I do have a six-year-old. Now, for information on more programs, please visit commonwealthclub.org. If you're not yet a member of the Commonwealth Club, today is a great day to join. There is staff present to answer any questions. Now, on to the program, which consists of two parts. During the first hour, we'll hear from the Honorable Therese McMillan, new Executive Director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. In the latter part of the hour, she will take written questions. You you will see that there are question cards around the room. Please write your questions, staff will collect those and bring them to Secretary Mineta for the moderated question and answer period. Now at the conclusion of the first hour with the Honorable Trees McMillan, we will pause for five to 10 minutes to reset the stage before we continue on to the second part. First, we will hear from our featured speaker, Dr. Asha Weinstein Agraw, at the, after the conclusion of our first hour, that is. She will present the highlights of the 10th Annual MTI National Survey on public opinion about transportation taxes and fees. Her featured speech will be followed by a panel of experts discussing the intersection between transportation and housing from their own unique perspective. Now, I want to remind everybody that the Commonwealth Club is a nonpartisan organization, and we ask that our speakers be allowed to deliver their comments without interruption. And now to the broadcast portion of today's event. It is my pleasure, my honor, to introduce the Honorable Norman Y. Mineta, retired Secretary of Transportation and a true American hero. Secretary Mineta is well known for his work in aviation, surface transportation, infrastructure, and national security. He's recognized for his accomplishments in economic development, science and technology, civil rights, and both foreign and domestic trade. Having served in Congress for 20 years, he then went to serve with distinction in two presidential cabinets, 
In 2000, he was named Secretary of Commerce by President Bill Clinton, and in 2001, Secretary of Transportation by President Bush. Secretary Mineta, we are honored with your presence. Please take it away. Good morning. <clears throat> if my voice breaks and cracks, I don't want you to think I'm going through puberty. <laughs> I had a neck uh, and back operation and, and I've gone through the similar problems that Rod has had in the past with my esophageal nerves and muscles and my throat muscles and nerves. So if the voice cracks, you'll uh, understand why that's happening. I want to welcome all of you to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know. I'm Norm Mineta, the former Secretary of Transportation and your moderator for today's program. Find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. And please check out the club's podcasts and video postings on YouTube and Facebook. Today's program is being sponsored by the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. And our topic today impacts every one of us, the intersection between transportation and housing. Now, while the San Francisco Bay Area is booming with jobs and for many high wages, people are increasingly being priced out of the housing market and the region is losing people to fill jobs that are essential to California's economy. In response to this crisis, we have seen a proliferation of transit-oriented development projects, TODs, which place high-density housing above or adjacent to transit centers. TODs provide easy mobility while offering less costly living space. Effective strategies used by planners, uh, policymakers, and advocates to implement high-quality, uh, <coughs> equitable, um, before, or I'm sorry, getting, to implement high quality, equitable, transit oriented station areas will be explored today. So, to address this subject and its related issues, I am very, very pleased to present the Honorable Therese McMillan, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Therese McMillan was named Executive Director of MTC on March 1 of 2019. In this position, she also serves as the top executive for the Association of Bay Area Governments. Ms. McMillan previously worked for 25 years at MTC uh, <clears throat> before her 2009 appointment uh, by then President Barack Obama to serve as the Deputy Administrator of the Federal Transit Administration in the U.S. Department of Transportation. She subsequently served as the Acting uh, Federal Transit Administration Administrator from March 2014 to March of 2016 before taking the position as Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authorities Chief Planning Officer in April 2016. So please welcome Therese McMillan. Okay. I'm a Thank you, Secretary Mineta, Norm, Karen, and all of you joining us today. 
This happens to be the longest day of the year, so we'll, hopefully that won't reflect on the longest speech you'll be hearing today. Since I've been back, I have often been asked, what did you learn in the 10 years that you have been away? What lessons have you brought back to the Bay Area? It is a fair question and worth reflecting a bit as that decade has shaped to a large degree my vision, at least insofar as I've been able to shape it today. So let's take a moment with Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles. As Norm introduced, I joined the Obama administration in July of 2009. And my first and most important lesson learned as a political appointee was to set priorities and hew to them relentlessly. You cannot have 15 number one priorities and expect to made, make headway with them in four years, or even eight if you're lucky enough to have that opportunity. You must be quick, true, and laser focused. Second, facing times of crisis makes you a better and stronger leader. Dealing on the front line with Hurricane Sandy and the LaFont Tunnel fire at WMATA, the um, transit agency that is located in Washington, D.C., greater area, drove home the value of nimble and decisive decisions, taking informed risks, and valuing teams in ways that I hadn't experienced before and will never forget. Third, if there is one thing the federal government revels in, it is process. Maneuvering through the demand, through all of that, demands patience and skill, and one quickly appreciates OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. That said, clarity and consistency makes for sound regulation, which sounds easy until it's not. Making policy and overseeing its impl implementation through rules and regulation that works in Alaska and Arkansas, California and Kansas, Lexington, Massachusetts, and Lexington, Kentucky is hard. And I appreciated the task of truly listening and weighing and balancing against my own initial biases and preferences. Out of the San Francisco bubble and onto the national stage was humbling as well as exhilarating. Los Angeles Metro was a different challenge and opportunity coming back to my native home. I was born and raised there. And living in a city where I had not actually lived there for 30 years, one that was at once familiar and astoundingly different. I led initiatives for the third largest transit agency in the country in a single county that is larger, more populous, and equally complex as the entire Bay Area. My tenure within LA Metro's undeniably unique operating and political culture drove home three important things as well. First and foremost, serve your customers, all of them, particularly those who have been historically underserved in the realm of public transport. Be unswervingly committed to public stewardship, as hard as that sometimes may be. LA Metro had just passed Measure M, uh, another permanent half-cent half sales tax in a county that was slated and estimated to raise $120 billion over 40 years, which meant that you had to be crucially accountable to making sure that people knew how you were managing that trust. Finally, be a partner, but lead in the void if times demand it. I work for a chief executive officer, Phil Washington, who often said, if there's no one at the front, then things won't get done. He had a distinguished career in the military, and that was reflected in what he brought back in terms of discipline and vision and not being afraid to go when, to places when things were hard. So... What does that mean for me coming home to the Bay Area? 
Let me start first with an observation that advances today's theme of the intersection of housing and transportation. Ten years out, I see a region increasingly imbalanced, a red-hot economy and jaw-dropping housing costs. Transportation demand that is outstripping the system's capacity to absorb it with an infrastructure that is steadily aging. Growing income inequality. That red-hot economy does not reach down to all of those needing a well-paying job, and it is leaving too many behind. An arrestive population who is asking a lot of questions and is not pleased with the answers they are getting when they get them at all. Now, this last point is particularly worrisome to me coming back because the San Francisco Bay Area residents have traditionally been nothing if not aggressively vocal in their opinions. And what they are telling us is that the very trends I just cited, among many other indicators, are worsening, not abetting. And their conclusion is no one is hearing us. Now, if that sounds overly dramatic to make a point, apologies, but I don't think I'm that far off. It's not as if gains have not been made or that improvements haven't been wrung out of very challenging political, legal, or fiscal environments in many circumstances over many years. But folks feel like we're backsliding, and that is nowhere more evident than the staggering housing prices, rental and purchase alike, and the crushing congestion that we see routinely on our major highway corridors. While the average combined commute times across all transportation modes, cars, carpools, and transit, now exceeds that of Los Angeles, perish the thought we are still not the aggregate worse in the country. In fact, we're middle of the pack. Again, when you look at car congestion coupled with how long it takes to take transit and the like. But that victory flag is hard to wave around those in Contra Costa County, for example, where one in four commuters travel over an hour every day to work, leading the pack in the region on that particular metric. But those grinding lengthy commutes should surprise no one, given the fact that over the last two decades, the Bay Area has led the nation in housing prices every single year, with recent data ranking Los Angeles number two. The region's home prices are approximately triple those of Miami, Philadelphia, Chicago, Dallas, and Atlanta. And those prices drive people out, further and farther out. Interestingly, in September of 2018, the definition of the San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland combined statistical area was expanded by the US Census to include both Merced and the Modesto Metropolitan Statistical area. This was done because that definition of a combined statistical area pivots off economic ties that are measured by commute patterns. So down there, there's a very specific and official recognition that the political boundaries of the Bay Area do not mesh with what people are experiencing every day. And now a little bit more on rents. The Bay Area has had the highest median rent payments of any major metro area in the United States since data first became available in the 1970s. But the numbers continue to stun. March of 2019, news media throughout the Bay Area reported that San Francisco rental prices had risen to 3,700 for a one bedroom. 2,540 for a one bedroom in San Jose. 
2,320 for a one bedroom in Oakland. These are frightening numbers. An entire generation of young people cannot afford to live here if they are not making multiple six-figure incomes. And this strikes very personally home for me because my youngest daughter just graduated last week from Oregon State University with her master's in athletic training. I am going to pick her up next week to move her back to the Bay Area to move in with us. <laughs> there was never a question that she had an option. It wasn't even on the table. And that happens repeatedly in households across now. And this is my daughter who's 26. I was well on my way at 26. And with the prices that I just indicated for a one bedroom apartment, I'm not going to ask for the show of hands, but I know, I'll raise mine, that is significantly more than my mortgage payment. <laughs> and so that's the reality that we are having to deal with. So what does all of this mean? Four months in, I don't have the substantive solution. But I can speak to how, perhaps, we must do our job as planners, as financiers, as employers, as politicians, differently as we try to take on these challenges. Let me illustrate this with a case study that was front and center for many of us in the region. At the time I was selected for the job, back in January, a major initiative, CASA, Committee to House the Bay Area, was wrapping up after an 18-month intensive work that was led by my predecessor, Steve Heminger. But it was advanced, importantly, by a partnership of local government, business, developers, and community advocates. And you probably will be hearing more about that um, with representatives of the panel, of the next panel. But in December of 2018, that group forwarded an ambitious and provocative slate of 10 points of initiatives to deal with the runaway housing crisis, as they viewed it, and advanced that 10 points late to the legislature. Now, the reaction was swift and contentious. Local government, in particular, made the case that they believed they had not been adequately involved in the development of the slate, its recommendations, or its priorities. Since March 1st, when I joined MTC and ABAG, a majority of my time, in fact, was helping to pivot from that particular discussion and move it to engage in dialogue on the hundreds of bills introduced by the legislature on housing. Three themes that were embedded in CASA also framed the work in Sacramento. Protection of those most vulnerable to the evaporation of affordable housing, especially renters, for renters. Preservation of naturally affordable housing stock before forces flip it into market rates beyond the reach not only of low income populations, but the missing middle of teachers, transit workers, healthcare providers, and the like. The third point, production of more housing for all income levels. Now, MTC and ABAG hosted five weeks of weekly meeting dialogues to debate and consider these bills, winnow them down to a set to take before the MTC and ABAG governing boards, and we managed to get a consistent position on a dozen of them that we felt were the most impactful in terms of the crisis that we're facing here in this region. Some of those bills are still in play, some have died or been significantly amended, and some have been recast as two-year bills. But the flash and focus on housing in Sacramento across the state continues. My point here is twofold. The housing crisis is real, 
And wherever you stand on the issues, you can't get away from it. Not when you talk about transportation, not when you talk about economic development, housing is emerging as a core factor. And it's not just in the Bay Area. It's in Los Angeles, where I dealt with it a lot in its most bleak form in terms of pervasive homelessness. That is a major focus in that region, as it is here. But throughout California, housing remains and probably will for some time in a forefront. So kudos to the governor and the legislators for taking on this issue. And kudos to the CASA team for letting the snarling, ugly beast of housing affordability out of the cage in the first place. Now, engagement on the recommendations should have been more inclusive, and we've been moving forward again to make the table big and make sure all voices are heard. But courage was demonstrated in throwing a burning light on an issue everyone else was afraid to see. So all of that, what are some big lessons learned as maybe shapes my vision, which is probably at this point, as I'm still doing reconnaissance on what's been going on in the Bay Area, but really focused on how we work. We must recapture a sense of responsive governance. That means first and foremost, listening to our customers. Whether that customer is our neighbor or a fellow BART writer or our kids and their friends, we must go out and seek voices across all spectrums to hear what they want and what they need. Not tentatively and selectively, but deliberately and comprehensively. Not defensively, not, not defensively but humbly. We can't start framing solutions if all the cards aren't on the table and any one of us doesn't hold all the cards. Secondly, we must develop what I call active partnerships. Having been outside of the Bay Area bubble, one thing I heard is that we are long on talk and short on action. Now, whether that's uniformly accurate may be up for debate. I would point to one important thing. In times of crisis, this region has stood up and it has moved demonstrated admirable leadership in times of crisis, whether it was Loma Prieta, the Oakland fire, or the recent wildfires in Napa and Sonoma, Sonoma prove that this region can move to action. At some point, though, you need to take a chance and maybe risk failing. The public sector in particular is not set up to bear such risk because we are rarely forgiven for trying something new and not having it work out. Venture capitalism and innovation is frankly reserved for the private sector who doesn't bear the same glare of public scrutiny. So if we want to see real public-private successful partnerships, that dynamic will need to change. All that said, we all hold the public interest, and that demands transparent stewardship certainly for government, but democratically for everyone. People need to know what their decision makers are considering, what we decide, and how we perform. This accountability must be brought to bear as we step forward to tackle these intersecting issues. Transportation, land use, housing, economic development, these challenges are inextricably intertwined and cannot be untangled. We cannot solve them in our separate cylinders of excellence, as I'd like to say. For those in the public sector that are often calling for agency-specific or local control, I ask, do you not also jointly own these intersecting issues that are undeniably beyond your political borders? For those private sector interests that call for proprietary data and other protections, even as they demand public investment, I ask, do you just call your own shots 
or do you share the failures as well as the opportunities this amazing region affords you? I cannot, you cannot, seek and provide answers to these regional challenges alone. None of us can. But I believe all of us are obligated to try harder. That's not enough, but it's a necessary start. Responsive governance, partnered action, transparent stewardship, and courage. They await. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Therese. <clears throat> so now it's time for our audience uh, question period, and we have a number of questions that have come up to the front, so I've, I'll start with this one. As many of our residents are moving further away from various high-density employer centers, what do transit leaders and managers need to do to promote transit affordability and improved customer experience? Well, it's a very good question, one I anticipated, because it goes back, I think, to the notion I said at the beginning that one of the things that often we don't do enough of is really understand who our customers are. And one of the things that is, is common in the industry is that you may have a lot of information, for example, in public transport about the area and the demographics of the area that you operate in, but not necessarily as deep an understanding of your actual riders. And one of the things that's really important in the Bay Area is the fact that with the multitude of transit operators that we have, very much unlike my experience in, in LA where there was one really big transit operator, um, and I don't want to you know, run down the rabbit hole of should we consolidate, should we merge, should we not. The point is we have a lot of transit operators, which means for these increasingly long commutes, if people want to take transit as an option, it means you have to transfer. So we need to have a lot better information about the patterns of riders, where these transfer points need to be, so you have the basic understanding first about what their travel needs are, and then build around that the solutions that may be available. It's also going to mean, quite frankly, as I, as I mentioned here, this joint ownership of the problems and the solutions. And there's been difficulty of having folks put that priority of example, fair integration, transit you know, coordination, and the like, on equal footing with what they see on a day-to-day -day basis with just getting service out the door. And don't minimize that. That's one thing I learned at LA Metro. That is difficult. That is hard. At the same time, we're not going to be able to provide that seamless system unless we develop some basis for having our boards and having our staffs view in a like manner, the you know, an equal priority for those issues. So that's really the start. If you have that context for decision making, the solutions themselves awful, often will fall from there much more easily. What role could high speed rail play in impacting housing? Is high speed rail dead or just delayed? <laughs> High-speed rail is not dead. High-speed rail is working through some clearly acknowledged funding challenges. And um, we certainly in the Bay Area, you know, stand firm to continue working with them because this state clearly needs as many um, arrows in the quiver as possible in terms of moving people around the state. So I'll take that, that second point first. With respect to housing, that's going to be a really interesting question because high-speed rail, of course, is designed to be an intercity service, but it's going to connect and will only be successful if it clearly connects well at the points where it stops and joins up with more regional or local areas. So from that perspective, like many others, putting density and, and services and transit 
a, or, um, a, in, in a transit-oriented type of structure around high-speed rail stations is a given, and particularly as it enters urbanized areas like San Francisco and um, LA in particular that will be, I mean, the challenge for high-speed rail there is moving into a heavily developed um, environment from the beginning, working really early on how that housing development can anticipate and design not to preclude high-speed rail will be an important task for us to do. Berlin is passing a rent freeze for five years to address its housing crisis. With other European cities expected to follow, could we do something similar given that um, incremental measures really aren't working? I'm not familiar with that, but one of the first questions I would ask is what subsidies are in place to allow for that type of rental control, and from what place are they coming from? Because I think that's a really fundamental and first thing. None of these controls are free. Um, it's clearly, I think, important, particularly as we consider the equity ramifications of this housing crisis, that we talk about very honestly of what it takes to provide affordable housing and what resources will be brought to bear to do that. Um, so in the case of, you know, our, our uh, and there's many lessons learned often to come from our foreign um, uh, uh, partners, but I think in those cases, one of the things to understand is how are they structured legally, financially, and in a government way to allow for that to be a sustainable approach? And can we learn from that and bring that back in terms of evaluating our options here? Now, a number of years ago, there was an approach that if you went further into the metropolitan area of a community, parking rates went up, other, other things uh, increased in cost. I haven't seen that much happening in that area recently. Is that something that's now sort of dead and gone by its board? Although I see that London is still pursuing that. Yeah, I, I, pricing and all of its manifestations has got to be something in the mix of dealing with the challenges at the magnitude we see. There's just no question. When I was in Los Angeles, just as I was leaving, they were initiating a significant study on congestion pricing. Um, I haven't had the time to catch up and see what's happening with that, but I understand that the, you know, the study RFP, I think, has been released or is soon to be released, and they're seriously going to take a look at, at what that would take. Parking is quite interesting because the one thing we know, um, and has proven itself over and over and over again, um, is that when, you know, whether it's a deliberate policy of parking pricing controls or just happens to be the market, that certainly is an incentive or motivation for people to consider other options as that increases. We all know that finding parking in San Francisco that's going to be less than, what, $40 a day? I haven't driven a car in here so long, I don't know. It's probably a lot more than that right now, um, is, has a significant impact on the choices that people make. And so, again, I think, like many other elements, that just has to be part of what we are considering in any particular community to see what might work in, in their circumstances. I'm going to give uh, two of these at the same time. Um, can you please comment further on the need for some additional state intervention in housing approvals, what authority should go to state, what should remain with locals? And the other question is, how do we overcome the fractured, dispersed nature of our governance uh, in terms of uh, regional solutions for housing policy and uh, transit agencies? Well, let me take the first one. I would say what's been 
remarkable about this legislative session and the housing bills um, that have been presented there is the desire to put forward some suggestions that otherwise would never have been thought about in terms of, of um, uh, more of a regulata regulatory environment for housing, whether it be from the state or at the local level. Um, and I think that comes from really responding to the crisis and wanting to motivate some level of reaction and action as a result. The jury is still out on a number of these bills. And whether or not there is a state level imposition of an approach is one of the most contentious things that's being discussed right now. But at least it has opened up a serious discussion of if not that, then what? What do you do instead if state level regulatory intervention is viewed as unpalatable? Then as a local, what are you doing instead? And so I think at this point, that's where we are in, the, in, in this discussion and we'll have to see what emerges from there. Um, the second point had to do with more our transportation fragmentation, which has been around 40 years. Um, I, there's basically two ways that you can initiate, well, there's three, I'll, I'll talk about the first two. There's sort of two ways you can initiate change. Basically regulation, forcing people to do something, or incentives that are motivating people to do something. And those, you know, two elements continue to exist in a number of different ways. In some areas like safety, you want regulation, right? I mean, one of the things that um, happened when I was at the Metropolitan, excuse me, um, at FTA, was that that agency had finally received congressional statutory authority to regulate the transit industry. Every other mode in US DOT had some level of safety regulatory framework except for FTA, which is kind of crazy. But it happened, and that was an instance where you did have to thread a needle that the safety regulatory authority that would apply to the New York MTA would have to look really different than Red Rose Transit in Pennsylvania. At the same time, there was a tiering of what is at least the basic level of safety that our riding population should expect and demand. And that's a really important arena where you want to see that happen. In, well, you know, you so, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would say beyond that, though, with, with multiple transit operators on the incentive side, sometimes that manages to move more toward work with the willing. It's a different philosophy. And what we see there is often an array of letting people perhaps work first toward a working model that a number of people then can follow. Um, I think that's one of the areas where we've seen some success is having maybe not every single Transit operator, as an example, in the Bay Area, work toward a different operating situation, but have a smaller cluster of them do something differently, or go toward those things that we can control directly in our policies, as opposed to ones where we need significant capital investment in other areas. So you just need to put a screen through as to regulation versus incentive, um, what's the most effective way which can change over time, so I'm not saying there's a fixed formula for this, but um, you, you, take it in, you take it in steps. It's interesting as I look at all of these questions, how <clears throat> there seems to be an underlying thought about whether or not local government is really able to deal with the uh, land use initiatives 
and uh, whether or not multifamily developments mm -hmm. uh, should be done by a regional agency. And um, like this one question here about supply, supply. What can the state government do to counter the nimbyism of local government leaders? Award-winning city plans uh, mean um, notifying if they are not deliverable uh, by the property sector. Uh, and so there's this thing about whether or not local government is really doing their job on land use planning, or does that have to be done by a regional agency, whether it be ABAG or MTC in terms of a, as a planning agency? One of the things that is, and again, I, I want to stress that this attention to housing has been accelerated in a pretty short time frame from a policy point of view, at least that I can ascertain. Um, again, my people have been maybe talking about housing and aware of housing, but it, re, it has reached this sort of crisis level. And again, I give props to that CASA, CASA initiative for, for pushing it forward in a way that I think a lot of folks had not been willing to take on. Um, so I believe there's still a lot of analysis and reconnaissance actually as to what is motivating this housing crisis. And I'll just say I'm learning a lot and it's really complicated. It is not just one thing. I and, and the Turner Center and others at UC Berkeley and others have been extremely helpful in helping to unpack all of the complexities that's involved in producing housing. Um, one thing that's really important, transportation, excuse me, land use and housing are not the same discipline. They're really different. And I think one of the things to really consider about who can do something better is to really say who actually has the authority and practice for doing it. MTC and ABAG is, you know, combined our transportation land use authority. Housing is different, which is not to say that f as, as we sort through and unpack and respond to this, certain things can be said, but I think we can't be cavalier about shifting expertise where expertise may not exist. So that's just something we need to be very mindful of. Um, and I think, though, we need to be very honest about when things aren't working in different communities, there's very different actions in play. In some cases, it w may well be um, how you know, the permitting and, um, and entitlement structure is set up. In others, it may well be that you literally can't get construction workers to build housing in a way that makes it remotely affordable and pencil out. I mean, those two things all exist in different ways, in different areas of the state and in our own region. So I don't want to walk further into an area. I'll be the first one to say don't comment on areas where you don't have deep expertise. But what I would say is that understanding the complexities of this, in short order, we can't spend five years doing it, is really important in order for our dec decision makers collectively to make some progress. Again, let me uh, combine some of these. Um, can you speak on how you imagine MTC working and partnering with adjacent regional planning agencies, for example, San Joaquin, Sacramento, to solve transportation and housing issues, and uh, with another similar, with the Northern California mega region expanding, has MTC begun communicating with SACOG and other regional MPOs on housing afford affordability outside of the borders? Um, yes. I think one of the things that, again, the focus in Sacramento on, um, and, and because so much of it being on housing, and importantly, on legislation that is statewide, right, not just, you know, in the Bay Area, um, has afforded an opportunity for us, um, you know, at the professional ranks to be, to start talking about 
um, how we might better collaborate, um, particularly if there's going to be state level um, directives um, or funding or funding um, uh, supplements. I know the, the, the governor's budget has some significant funding that's being directed toward um, housing planning and the like that's really important. And you know, the four major areas had really talked about what eligibilities and other things would be helpful. So yes, we're beginning to, to discuss it. Um, but it's, um, it's a challenge also, because the as I mentioned in this statistical, um, what the, the census just did for the Bay Area, one of the things that we need to recalibrate in our heads is planning around political boundaries or planning around functional boundaries, right? And partly a huge problem is that resources are defined around the political boundaries and not the functional boundaries in many cases, certainly at the state and federal level. So when you get into this border problem of where it's bleeding into each other, it makes not only the, you know, defining and actually just creating a space to define the problems differently can actually be really hard. Um, and defining the solutions when the money that's available to underwrite those solutions is defined in very sharp definitions also can be really difficult. So if there's one thing where I think there's a, a, a rich area to begin talking with our fellow regions about, particularly when our borders align, is how does that work in terms of resources to problems? And that's often very territorial. I'll be the first to say that often that conversation can't even get off the ground. But I think if we don't begin to think about how to scale the resource to the problem outside of these boundaries that aren't aligned, it's going to be just increasingly difficult to deal with those issues. The uh, <clears throat> governor recently commented that transportation dollars should be linked to housing production. This chicken and egg scenario seems to hurt both transit and housing. Mm -hmm. Any comment? Well, that, that proposal um, met with a lot of uh, controversy. I would say some, in broad strokes, um, if you, timing can be everything. I think it was incredibly important to recognize that the um, funding in question at that point, which was SB1 funding, um, had been defined and passed by the voters for some very specific issues and problems. I mean, that was just a foundational thing one had to recognize. Looking forward, the concept of, of incentivizing change in once and in these tangled interrelated issues particularly <clears throat> if it's new funding that's designed to be an incentive is something perhaps to explore but it's very tough to go backwards and take um, and 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 it's just a reality that's very tough to take existing sources on needs that haven't been remotely fully satisfied and, and think about a redirect. So that's just the reality of the fact that we're in a financially constrained environment where there's never enough funding to deal with all the issues we have. So again, beginning to think about perhaps funds that are no longer transportation funds and housing funds and economic development funds, but funds that have more fluidity between those issues is probably a more effective model to begin to think about. And working out of those silos, again, is really tough. Um, when I worked at the federal government, 
We had st uh, President Obama had launched a major initiative called Partnership for Sustainable Communities. It was a partnership between USDOT and HUD and um, EPA and actually um, U.S. Department of Agriculture that oversaw rural development. And the th thinking at the time was that we were going to come forward with a definition of these interrelated you know, challenges and come up with these programs that would overlay all of them. And the one thing that just crashed and burned out the door was blending money. <laughs> that jet just went nowhere. <laughs> We were able to talk about coordinating eligibility requirements in our separate programs to try to catalyze like, you know, in, in, um, complementary investments, if you will, in different sectors in a particular location. So kind of coming at it from that way. But the idea of, and you could appreciate this, Norm, just putting everyone's money in a big old pot and reassigning it did not go anywhere. <laughs> and I think, but, it, but again, that's not to say as you look to new sources of funding, often more flexible at the local level, mind you, you might not think about a more multidisciplinary eligibility for that in a way that could be more helpful. Let me, um, what are your thoughts on Hyperloop and trying new innovative ways of transportation? And what's your take on bicycles and scooters in downtown? Whoa! <laughs> okay. Um, oh boy, Hyperloop. Yeah, it was right in my backyard in LA. Um, one of the interesting things, I'll, I'll, I'll make a, uh, let me put the scooters and bikes, because I think they're two very different questions. The Hyperloop question, I think, more broadly, is a question of how are we positioning ourselves to absorb new innovation? And in transportation, a huge challenge, um, particularly working with my, um, when I was working at the Federal Transit Administration and now, you know, and, and Metro and others, is innovation moves so, so much more quickly than the required, again, funding regulatory structure that's set up around public transportation allows to take in. Um, but we were, be at least in LA Metro, we were beginning to make headway in trying to, again, create these spaces where you don't try to change your entire transportation system, but identify and carve out areas where you can pilot new technologies. And quite frankly, the way that LA was able to do that more or less successfully was being able to have local, much more flexible funding as opposed to you know, state and federal funds that just bring a lot more strings to the table. Um, but I still believe that's an, you know, it, it's, it's one of the areas we need to think about partnerships more creatively with the, with the private sector. Um, I think that working collaboratively to innovate together in a design challenge or a problem is perhaps a more helpful model, again, I'm just sort of thinking ahead based on my past experience, than having an innovation created over here and then trying to put it on top of an existing structure, you know, uh, that, that just may not be able to, to take it in. So sort of innovation in a collaborative design at the front may be something that we could explore further as an industry. Um, because quite frankly, at some point, when you think about safety and other things, there is an element of private interest where regulation is important. And figuring out a way how to make those, those um, interests intersect, I think, is important there. The bicycle scooter issue, what was the, that Just question? The use of uh, the increased use of. Increased use. <laughs> well, I, you know. Again, being in, in, back in San Francisco and then my experience in LA is so interesting to combine them. Um, first last mile, B 
became first five mile (laughs) often in Los Angeles. It was a very different perspective. Um, And those kinds of, you know, really expanding the way to get people from their door to the transit system was a very big challenge that was embraced aggressively in Los Angeles because quite frankly, the way that the the service area is such that you you just don't have the kinds of frequency and density and locational things such as at San Francisco. You just ex- downtown LA d- was beginning to develop that, and you could see a different thing there. But generally, I think you know broadly, scooters, um, bicycles, uh, that whole shared opportunity has a lot of a, a lot of value. I think it's a fair question that there be sensitivities to how those integrate into neighborhoods. Um, I think the concerns about blocking sidewalks and a number of other issues are legitimate ones. That said, I don't think that we can reasonably expect our um, definition of the network of public transportation to remain in the same model we had 20 years ago. We need to keep thinking about what that integrative system looks like to really allow people to not have a single occupant car. And I'm sure there's an automated vehicle thing somewhere in that stack. (laughs) Let me ask you about the, uh, because it's sort of a, excuse me, um, sort of a sticks in my craw. My three-year-old granddaughter has to wear a helmet to ride her tricycle. Mm-hmm. And in Washington, D.C., and I'm not sure how it is in other communities, but we're being overrun by these scooters. And they're on the sidewalks, they're on the street, they wear no helmets, and I don't know if there's been a study on the whole issue of safety in terms of accidents and what related kinds of, of um, studies we have. But uh, scooters seem to be unrelated to uh, any regulatory yeah. subjectivity. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a re- really good point. I think it comes back to this, you know, what it takes to bring new innovations into a environment that still respects the public interest. I think that's a huge deal, I really do. And and I think um, things like, well, it's sort of related to the comment I had about, you know, the private sector wanting to call their own shots. Well, sometimes you can't. You know, sometimes that's great up to a point until you involve um, major safety concerns that need to be addressed as you're as you're working in a public space. Okay, so there's there's an accountability, I think, Norm, to to that your concern and question, that stretches beyond just that particular thing. But any time that we're that again we're we're working in this public private partnership and what that looks like, defining what the public interest is, and owning and holding that jointly. I think really is core to, to advancing how we work together in solving these problems, whether they're transportation or housing or the like. Um, you know, the, the, the housing jobs in balance in this region is a critical one. And there's a lot of questions being raised about we absorb and take in and create thousands of jobs. And yet what we've seen is that, you know, that same motivation to create equivalent thousands of housing just didn't happen. And how do you catch up with that? So I think that's, again, I don't have the answer, but those are the right questions that are being asked. And I think we just need to continue to pursue the appropriate forums in the ARO to explore what those answers need to be. As a transit manager, we struggle with competing with travel times and showing operational speeds that make our service unattractive. 
thoughts on how we can advocate for transit priority? Yes, I mean, one of, one of the, the, the key things that we dealt with in LA, and I imagine in any major urbanized area, it's the same thing, is realizing that if you don't have a separated guideway, your street is your guideway. It just is, you know? So that, again, the cylinders of excellence where we had highway planning over here and transit planning over there. I'm looking at Bijan, he's laughing. Um, that is one of the places where I think we've made some headway. But again, it struggles from, we, we continue to struggle with both funding and regulatory and less so, um, you know, planning issues that are, that are, that are separated. Um, I, you know, at some point in a fixed system of capacity, you will need to make trade-offs. You just will. Um, the development of um, our express lane network that we're working on at MTC, we've been doing a very thoughtful uh, work with our counties and others to, to plan what that might look like going forward. If you're adding new lanes to allow for that express lane capacity to happen, that's expensive. And you will only be able to go so far. I mean, obviously, the whole point of it is to raise some tolls and reinvest in the system. But there's just so much space in the Bay Area. And so part of our planning work, I think, has to more honestly deal with the fact that trade-offs are inherent. And we need to collectively to decide at the end of the day what's, in, what's important. And as good planners, we can show perhaps much better than we've done in the past. We're beginning... I, at, I'm very proud of the work at MTC of this horizon scenario planning that we're doing that we don't have enough time to fully talk about, but it's creating, again, this environment to really push and test what happens under very, very different futures and to say what investments work best under those different futures and might those be the ones that you start with. So I think a lot of this is admitting that you're never going to get everything you can. Trade-offs are core to what planning is about, and to really not be afraid of looking at very different futures, because the one thing you know is that you don't know what that's going to be. And planning better in an, in a, in an arena of uncertainty is one of the things where I think that we have the opportunity to do a much better job and in that case, then, to have a much better and more informed discussion with our stakeholders, whether, again, they're private sector, public sector, city, state, federal, than we've had in the past. Okay, unfortunately, we've reached that point in our question period where there's time for only one last question. I'm going to combine these last two. Um, as we talk among partners, how do we get realtors, bankers, appraisers, et cetera, to come to dialogue instead of opposition? And then somewhat related, but how can race be a more central part of the conversation about housing and transportation, especially given the racist history of single family zoning mm -hmm. and its continuing legacy in this area? Let me. So with the first one, um, in terms of, of realtors and the like, I think, you know, I, I don't think that's any different than the broader question or the broader observation I made about, you know, establishing a forum where folks need to jointly own what we're trying to accomplish. If we have a region where our young people can't afford to live here. <laughs> if we have, and I, again, I've been in more countless things about folks saying we can't recruit people to work here. 
We can't bring talent to this region because people literally cannot afford to work here. So I would say on that first part, it's, it's making the table big enough that people who jointly share these issues commit to sitting there and talking through their various perspectives. I mean, I think at its most basic, that's, that's where we are. And I think that ends, and I'm glad we had that question on race, because at the end of the day, all of this pivots on it being equitable and inclusive for everyone who's here. And recognizing a lot of the work that I did at the federal government and LA Metro was on equity, developing an equity platform for LA Metro that spoke to the need to recognize the failures of the past before you can move forward with outlining where you go in the future. And race and cultural have been foundational to what has not worked in our cities. It just is. And to the degree that we're willing to acknowledge that and then talk about what it takes to be truly inclusive in, in looking forward and defining where we need to go um, will be one of the marks of success or failure in our planning going forward. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Now, this program has been sponsored by the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. Thank you to our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. We also want to remind everyone in this room that following the conclusion of this portion of the program, our discussion will continue following a five-minute pause to reset the stage. So thanks again to Therese McMillan for an excellent presentation. I'm Norm Mineta, former US Secretary of Transportation, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you found the first hour as informative and engaging as I did, and humorous at times as well. We're pleased to begin the next portion of today's program. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Asha weinstein Agaral, who will summarize results from the 10th year of an annual survey exploring national support for federal transportation revenues through gas taxes and mileage fees. After her presentation, the panel will commence. We're pleased to collect written questions, so just hold them up in the air and staff will come and collect them and bring them to me. I'd like to thank Therese McMillan once again and Secretary Mineta for the first hour of today's program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker. Dr. Asha weinstein Agaral is the director of the Mineta Transportation Institute Finance Center. She also serves as our director of education. And if she weren't busy enough, She's a full professor in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at San Jose State University. Her research is focused on transportation policy and planning with a special emphasis on finance and pedestrian and bicycle issues and transportation history. Asha, please share your results. Thank you, Karen, for that introduction. Microphone working? Yeah, good, okay. So I am delighted to be here for the 10th time um, at the Commonwealth Club to share the breaking news of results from an annual trend survey that, we, that MTI has sponsored looking at how the public views options for raising more federal transportation revenue. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about a public opinion poll that we have released today. Um, I think it went up on our website at 8.30 this morning. Um, and there are some little one-page research briefs at the back of the room if any of you are interested in learning a little bit more. 
I also want to acknowledge my research partner, Dr. Hillary Nixon, and offer my deep thanks to MTI for funding us year after year, even though Karen sometimes grumbles about the expense. <laughs> um, so this year's survey uh, builds on trends that we established in the previous nine, but we also made a few significant changes. So I'm going to just quickly lay out sort of the overview and, and highlight a few of the changes for those of you who have been following along with us over the years. Um, first though, let me explain what has not changed. We have designed a survey to test public knowledge and opinions about the federal gas tax and also the concept of replacing the gas tax with a new mileage fee. Um, and we've tested support for different variations on both this idea of raising the federal gas tax rate and introducing the new mileage fee. Because this survey is meant to not only give us a snapshot of public opinion today, but look at trends, we have kept the wording from year to year identical. <laughs> um, kept the wording identical for a number of the different tax options. We've asked people, would you support this or not? Um, so this is all what has remained the same. However, there are some things that are new. One change um, is that we were able to add questions on three new topics, which I'm quite pleased about. First, we asked about people's priorities for how federal transportation revenue should be spent. I don't have time to talk about that today, but it's in our report. Um, secondly, we explored a little bit about people's knowledge of how much they actually pay in federal gas taxes. And third, we delved a little bit more deeply into some opinions related to mileage fees that we think may be shaping whether people support or oppose the concept. Um, the other key difference is that we've changed um, our surveying method. Uh, all of our previous polls were random digit dial phone surveys, um, but we've gone online this year. 90% um, of Americans are now online, making it you know, a reasonable way to capture um, the general public's opinion, and it's a whole lot cheaper. Um, it also allows us to ask questions in sort of different formats that it's hard to do with a, a phone survey. At any rate, we have ended up with a nationally representative sample of 2,723 adults um, who were recruited through an online survey panel from the firm Qualtrics. So let me now turn to our findings. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about gas taxes and then mileage fees. So gas taxes. I'd like to ask you just to take a moment and um, think about your answers to two questions that we asked our respondents. First of all, what is the federal gas tax rate? Um, and secondly, how much do you pay annually in federal gas taxes? Now, we added both of these questions because there has been a great deal of um, kind of speculation that people don't have a very good handle on these numbers, um, but there's actually very little evidence out there of, of what people really do believe. Um, you probably won't be shocked to hear that most respondents did not know what the federal gas tax rate is, um, and indeed, they tended to overestimate the rate. Um, so for example, one out of five respondents thought that the ga federal gas tax rate is at least 76 cents per gallon. Now, given that it's 18.4 cents, um, that is a lot of people who are not just overestimating, but who are way overestimating what the tax rate is. Um, we also asked people this question about what they think they annu pay annually, which, by the way, I would have to also kind of sit down and calculate. It's not something I have at the tip of my tongue, despite my professional interests. Um, and again, people. Um, estimated considerably higher than we believe they're actually paying. Um, the sort of at the um, median value was about 200. Um, the average value people reported was more in the $400 range, um, which, which evidence suggests is, is quite a bit higher than people actually pay on average. Um, so that's what people know about what they are paying in gas taxes. Turning to the matter of whether people would support raising the gas tax rate, we found here that the answer depends a great deal on how the revenue will be spent. When it comes to earning public support, all gas taxes are not alike. So first, when we asked people about increasing the tax rate by 10 cents per gallon, 
and told them just generally that this would be for transportation. No other details give. Uh, support for this idea was 40%. Um, which actually, by the way, is, is to me somewhat surprisingly high, but still it's definitely not a majority. However, when we asked people about that same 10 cent per gallon tax increase and told them that the revenue would be dedicated to maintaining the transportation system, support rose to 75%. Let me just say that number again, 75%. Um, that's what I would call a super, super majority for those of us in California who think in, in terms of super majorities. Um, but more important even than that, that number 75% in and of sort of itself, to me is what we can learn by comparing 75% to 40%. So simply by changing the idea of a gas tax rate raise from, well, it'll be for transportation to it will be to maintain the transportation system, we get a 35 percentage point increase in support. Um, again, how you frame a tax matters. And I, I think we should be pleased. The public is thinking a little bit more carefully about this, and they're not just either knee-jerk accepting or rejecting kind of the concept of tax. They're thinking about it. Um, similarly, when we tested out some variants on that 10 cent per gallon increase that would dedicate the money either to safety or to different environmental objectives, we got considerably more people supporting those than supported that plain old transportation, you know, in general with no specificity given. Now let me turn to the question of trends over time, because a key objective of this multi-year survey project has been to think about how our public opinion is changing or not on these matters. When I compare the results from this year's survey to the nine previous surveys um, and the five gas tax variants where we've asked the exact same questions, same language year after year, um, there's a pretty simple message. Support for the gas tax has risen slowly but steadily since 2010. Um, and in fact, this year in 2019, for every one of these five different gas tax variants we asked about, support today is at least 13 percentage points higher than it was in 2010. So it's not a huge increase, but it is a real increase. And if you kind of look in our report, we show you know, the trends, and it's a pretty steady, slow, upward um, movement. So now turning to mileage fees. Um, and again, here we asked a, a few more questions than we've been able to do in the past. One thing we were curious about is if there were a mileage fee, how do people want to pay for it? Um, and we found that they prefer to pay in small increments rather than getting a lump sum bill. Um, so the most popular payment option among those we offered people was that they would prefer to pay each time they buy gas or charge an electric vehicle. So essentially mimicking the situation to now. Nobody budgets to pay the gas tax, it's just a cost added on every time you fill your tank. Um, much less popular was the idea of people getting an annual bill. Um, only 23% of people said that that would be their preferred way to pay a mileage fee. Um, and then a few more than that um, liked the idea of a monthly fee. But again, sort of the single most popular option was just I pay every time that tax every time I, I buy gas or charge my vehicle. We also learned that people hold pretty nuanced views about equity and privacy matters related to mileage fees. Um, the survey results certainly show that these are issues of concern to people, but also that people sort of see and are willing to consider some of the different angles to these topics. Um, and let me just share one example here. About half of respondents agreed with both of the statements I'm about to read you. So they agreed that Mileage fees are an invasion of privacy. But they also agreed with the statement, I'm already tracked everywhere I go through my phone, so having my mileage tracked for a mileage fee won't really bother me. Um, so on face value, these would seem like, wait a second, people are confused. You know, these are kind of opposites. Well, I would argue that probably not. Um, and I can only speculate, but my guess is that we should interpret this to mean that people are not terribly bothered 
about being tracked, even though, in this case, even though they do see it as an invasion of privacy. Um, and again, you know, there, more work is needed to really unpack how people feel on this matter. But again, I think the point that I really take away from this is it's not a just knee-jerk reaction where you say the words mileage fees and privacy and people are immediately opposed and upset. Um, people do think through and see the nuance. And as policymakers, that's something that we need to kind of learn more about and work and build policies that flow from our understanding of, of the public's thoughts. So let me just conclude, um, sum up by saying that our research suggests that transportation tax increases can be acceptable to the public, but under certain circumstances. So both our current survey and the previous nine all show quite definitively that people are more likely to support a gas tax increase if the revenues are dedicated to types of, of uses that they support, with maintenance year after year coming out on top, um, safety also very popular, and certainly also popular um, environmental improvements that we could achieve. With respect to mileage fees, um, we learned this year that people are more likely to accept the concept if they pay in small increments, sort of as they purchase gas or charge vehicle, um, not an annual bill, not so popular. Um, and also that although privacy and equity are certainly touchy subjects and central to developing any kind of, of sustainable mileage fee policy, people really do hold somewhat nuanced views on these and are willing to think through the different angles to these matters. So for anybody who wants to learn more, we have up, as of 8.30 this morning, um, our final report on the MTI website, free downloadable PDF, with dozens of tables and hundreds of numbers that you can pour through for those of you who um, are policy wonks and really want to know more about it. Um, and of course, after the event today, if anyone has, has comments or questions, I'll be happy to stick around and talk um, after the panel discussion concludes. So thank you very much. Thank you so kindly, Asha, for sharing those results. Um, pretty astounding that if we link it correctly to what the funds will be used for, we can gain supermajority support. And that's a lesson for our elected officials and for going forward, I do believe. Now, it's my pleasure to officially call to order the last panel of today's program. We are going to hear from each of these experts sharing their own unique perspective about the intersection between transportation and housing. Now, I'm going to to start with Lori Berman. She's the director of the California Department of Transportation, better known as Caltrans. She was appointed by Governor Brown in 2018, and she leads the more than $8 billion organization and nearly 20,000 employees that build, maintain, and operate the 50,000 lane miles of California's transportation system. She finds the time to share her knowledge with us She's paving the way for future leaders. Lori, take it away. Thank you, Karen. And it's a pleasure to be here at the Commonwealth Club this morning. I can think of no more worthy and complicated a subject to discuss than the intersection of transportation and housing. To appreciate the size and importance of this topic, consider this. What in our society doesn't intersect with transportation and housing? It's a pretty short list. So it should surprise no one that the overlap between housing and transportation is both enormous and complex. At its simplest level, where people live is largely a product of what they can afford and how easily they can travel to where they work, play, shop, and visit with friends and family. For decades, a major portion of Caltrans' work was dedicated to building out the state highway system to more effectively connect these different compass points in people's lives. So as population grew within our metro areas, we widened our highway corridors. In suburbia and exurbia, we built more roads to reach the new housing, businesses, and commercial centers. But that era of major highway expansion is largely over. In most metro areas, we've widened our highways to the max. And people hunting for affordable housing options have pushed so far out into the hinterlands that we're now experiencing the unintended consequences of super commuters people who are commuting several hours a day. Not only are too many people stuck in rush hour for two hours or more, but it's not a healthy situation for anyone. 
People sit for long stretches in their cars, they spend more time away from their families, and their cars are emitting a lot of extra greenhouse gases. So when you consider the state's need to add upwards of 3.5 million housing units by 2025, this poses unique challenges for transportation planners at Caltrans and elsewhere. These include, where can we build these homes without adding to sprawl? Are there enough infill opportunities out there, including using Caltrans owned property? And how much of that new housing can be located close to mass transit centers so we can avoid continuing to add to congestion and GHG emissions? Fortunately, Governor Newsom takes an all-hands-on-deck approach with these issues. This brings everyone together to leverage our different resources and, ex and ex expertise toward more successful outcomes. This thinking also applies to how Caltrans um, administers SB1 funds. For those not familiar, SB1 is short for California Senate Bill 1, which was passed in 2017 to provide an additional $5 billion annually in state transportation funds. A lot of this money is going towards repairing and replacing our existing transportation infrastructure, but the legislation also directs Caltrans to help fund and improve mass transit and active transportation options like walking and bicycling. This forces us to think of transportation more broadly than just the road and highway system. For instance, when including a new bike lane in a complete streets design, we now must ask ourselves whether we are incorporating the right features to encourage as many people as possible to make a trip by foot or by bike rather than by car. Or what are the smartest transit investments to encourage more developers to move forward with those needed high density infill housing projects? Or providing grants through Caltrans $17 million Sustainable Communities Grant Program to study how, for example, to address parking overflow issues at specific BART stations and maximize transit use. And we can't forget the social equity element. For instance, in the primarily urban and suburban counties of California, the average household spends a combined 59% of its income on just housing and transportation. This is far higher than the recommended upper limit of 45 to 50%. So after a household pays for food, clothing, health costs, and other necessities, this leaves little discretionary income, which explains why 40% of Americans lack the savings to cover a $400 emergency. Now consider how extra challenging it is for low-income households who typically spend an even higher percentage of their incomes on housing. This creates an impossible choice between getting a car fixed in order to get to work or getting a medical prescription filled. In other words, in this extremely challenging, brave new world, simple wins will not be enough. We need some super wins. So let me share a couple of creative examples of what Caltrans is doing. This includes a unique new initiative Caltrans is helping to launch called the California Integrated Travel Project, or Integrated Travel for short. It's a first of its kind statewide initiative to better connect California's many mass transit agencies, increase convenience, and improve ridership. Currently, we have more than 200 mass transit agencies throughout California. But for travelers to research their mass transit options to go from, say, Sacramento to the Bay Area, they must visit multiple websites and then pay separately for those fare and transit cards. But consider how many more people would consider keeping that car in the garage if they could research and book multiple legs of their mass transit journey just as easily as a multi-leg flight around the world. And how convenient would it be if they had to only show a single computer-generated ticket or code to board each train, bus, and ferry? You may be wondering, what does this have to do with housing? By making mass transit more convenient, the goal is to increase ridership and make living near transit centers more valued. This should also increase revenues for transit agencies, lessen congestion, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Demonstration pilots for the Integrated Travel Project will start as early as next year. Integrated travel is an example of a multimodal project that Caltrans sees as one of the keys to addressing our housing and transportation crises. Another good project that checks a lot of boxes is the East Bay's new BRT, or Bus Rapid Transit, Rapid Bus Service, of which Caltrans is one of many partners. This project runs 10 miles between downtown Oakland and the San Leandro BART station. And because the project features dedicated bus lanes and specially timed traffic signals, it is often referred to as light rail on wheels. Though not a highway project, the East Bay BRT will relieve congestion on nearby Interstate 580 by providing attractive non-car options. The project even makes biking more attractive with the inclusion 
of new bike lanes and bike services at bus stations. From a housing perspective, projects like the East Bay BRT and integrated travel are all about breaking California out of its car-centric culture. Caltrans will always invest to make the existing highway system work more efficiently, but investments in mass transit are critical to reduce the number of car trips made, reduce greenhouse gases, and encourage more multifamily developments within our established metro areas. Super wins like these are not easy to craft, especially from a financing perspective, but they are essential to help us solve our statewide housing and transportation challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I, I really appreciate you providing that critical perspective from a state DOT lead. Let's turn now to Pedro to frame the issue from the housing expert perspective. Next, we'll hear from Pedro Galveo. He's a senior policy manager at the nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. He leads the regional work, and very importantly, he successfully championed the incorporation of an affordable housing-focused action plan for the region's 40-year strategic plan Bay Area. This is critically important. Pedro, tell us about the issue. Thank you so much for having me here, and, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I'm Pedro Galvan with the Nonprofit Housing Association in Northern California. We are a long-standing affordable housing advocacy organization celebrating our 40th year uh, this year. And our mission is to see a Bay Area where everyone has an affordable and stable place to call home. And so today I was hoping to walk you through some of the solutions that we've pushed for to address our regions and state affordable housing crisis. So in California, we have a number of distinctions. We have, we're the world's fifth largest economy. We have a public university system that's the envy of the nation. We have Apple, we have Google, and we have Hollywood. We also have a terrible distinction of being the 49th state in terms of affordability. Um, and the Bay Area alone has six of the ten, ten, six of the nation's ten most expensive metro areas. <laughs> the Bay Area only has nine counties, so that's quite a big chunk. Um, and as a result of that, what we're seeing is what Laurie alluded to with mega commutes. The Bay Area. The Bay Area has one of the largest numbers of mega commuters anywhere in the country, so much so that the cities of Stockton and Modesto have essentially become bedroom communities for Silicon Valley. And so here's what we know in terms of solutions. We know that affordable housing is a transportation solution. This has been repeatedly proven by research into what happens when low income live near transit. Research by our partners demonstrated that when you have affordable homes within a quarter mile of high quality transit, they, those residents drive at just half the rate were, were, um, of their higher income counterparts in those same locations. When the state of California invested some of its cap and trade revenues into 58 new affordable housing developments near transit, it also found that a reduction of 8,000 cars from, from the state's roads and enough decrease in vehicle miles traveled to cover the distance from the earth to the sun. So can... <laughs> so the state saw a reduction of vehicle miles traveled of 93 million miles, which is the distance to cover from the earth to the sun, um, wow. by investing its cap and trade revenues in affordable housing by high quality transit. And so can you imagine a Bay Area where even if we were to make what sounds like a modest investment of 58 new affordable developments, that's not modest at all, but each year um, and reducing the number of cars in the 101 or the 280 by 8,000 cars a year, we would certainly live in a much more livable place. Um, and as I don't ne need to repeat, what we're seeing is a steady degradation of our quality of life and communities torn apart by the displacement that our region's experiencing due to the housing crisis. One very telling statistic that I saw recently is that the Bay Area is now more residentially segregated today than it was in 1970, the year after the Fair Housing Act was passed. And so here's how NPH has been engaging with these questions. We believe that transportation decisions cannot be made in a vacuum. They need to be tied to housing. 
And this is a reality that the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, under actually the leadership of Supervisor Cortese at the time, championed. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission um, understood back in 2013 when NPH and other advocates said, hey, we have state housing laws that have been flat out ignored by many of our cities and counties. Could we tie some of the region's transportation funding to actually having cities be compliant with state housing law? It was a bold solution at the time. The commission took that leadership, uh, exerted that leadership, and as a result, all the Bay Area cities and counties now have up-to-date housing plans, which are critical for providing homes for all of our region's residents. And this idea was so successful that now Governor Newsom is considering a similar measure at the state level, looking at SB1 funding and whether or not every city and county in the state is doing its fair share to address the state's housing crisis. Another solution that we have championed is we see that building homes near transit is an essential component of having a holistic approach to transportation. And BART, um, where Abby works, has really taken a huge leadership role in addressing that by putting forward a bold plan that seeks to build 20,000 new homes, 7,000 of which are going to be affordable by their station areas. Yet BART, like most transit agencies up until last year, lacked any authority other than goodwill by local governments to implement that plan. MPH worked on a bill called AB 2923 that gave BART the authority to establish the zoning that they need to implement their ambitious housing agenda on land that they already own. These are not historic community assets. These are parking lots that largely sit underutilized that BART has identified could be used to address our region's housing needs. And we believe they ought to be able to do that. This year, NPH also worked on a bill, SB 50, to increase density near transit statewide, but also coupled with high levels of affordability while acknowledging the historic effects of redlining where many low-income communities of color live in transit-oriented neighborhoods and have had their voices historically taken away. The approach that we took with SB 50 was to push for the highest possible levels of affordability while hitting pause on the rezoning that would happen as a result of that bill in low-income communities of color so that they could plan for their own futures with the affordability levels and anti-displacement measures that they saw fit. Finally, we can't ignore that affordable housing needs investment now more than ever. While affordable housing is subsidized housing, that doesn't mean it's free. And we can't just invest in transportation without housing. They're two sides of the same coin. And so the state estimates that the Bay Area needs about 13,000 new affordable homes each year just to keep up with demand. That's a gross understatement. Um, this does not take into account the many decades of underproduction of affordable homes. Really, they need as much more. But to meet that, we need about $1.5 billion per year, just the 13,000 number. It's a huge number, but we're looking into how we actually fill that up. Counties like Santa Clara County, where Supervisor Cortese took a lead role, as well as Supervisor Chavez, in passing Measure A, have stepped up and said, we need to do our part. We need to provide for affordable homes for our residents. And NPH has worked alongside them. But the Bay Area still has a major crutch um, that's a leftover from the Great Recession. The state, dissolved the, the, the state dissolved redevelopment agencies that in the Bay Area alone used to raise a quarter billion dollars for affordable housing each year. After 2012, that money literally disappeared into thin air and we have not seen it back. And so NPH is researching, well, what can we do? How does the public feel about addressing housing from a regional perspective? And so through polling we conducted in April by, through EMC research, we know that Bay Area voters, especially renters, are concerned about housing for themselves, and almost all are concerned about housing for underserved communities. Listen to these numbers. 82% of voters are concerned about low-income 
and disadvantaged families being able to find an affordable place to live. Nearly 80% are concerned about the homeless finding a place to live, and 75% are concerned about friends and family members being able to find an affordable place to live here. Three out of four voters agree that we need a regional approach to housing in the Bay Area, not simply city-by-city city policies, and 79% of renters in the region are concerned about finding a place to live for themselves. What these numbers tell us is that this is not a niche issue. This is something that it impacts every single one of us, the viability of our business to keep going, our quality of life, our environment, our environment, and frankly, the viability of the Bay Area as a region. And so we all agree that land use and transportation are linked. And to that end, we need a holistic strategy on transportation and housing in order to achieve a strong, vibrant, and affordable Bay Area we all want to live in. That is why transportation decisions must be made with housing in mind. We must do all we can to encourage the construction of more affordable homes near transit, and we have to treat housing as infrastructure, not as an afterthought. Everyone here needs a home just as much as we need roads and bridges. We have to think about housing in that way. Otherwise, we, we risk losing the economic vitality that makes the Bay Area such a wonderful place to call home. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are some, some staggering numbers that you shared. Um, I'll be thinking about the data that you provided. And it's a perfect segue now to turn to our elected official, Supervisor Dave Cortese. He represents District 3 in the Santa Clara County. But prior to joining the Board of Supervisors, where he served four years as president, Mr. Cortese served on the San Jose City Council, including two years as vice mayor. He's the former chair of MTC and an alternate member of the Santa Clara County Valley Transportation Authority. Supervisor Cortese, what role do elected officials play in the intersection between housing and transportation? Well, thank you so much, uh, Karen. And before I um, start to answer the question as concisely as I can, um, I want to thank Secretary Mineta. I want to thank um, um, the Mineta Transportation Institute, San Jose State University, you, Karen, and, and everyone who's been involved in pulling this together because uh, this kind of dialogue, given the numbers that we just heard uh, from Pedro in terms of public engagement right now, is, is something that's I, I believe needs to continue to happen so that we don't lose that public engagement. Um, it is a good thing uh, when you see for the first time in decades, certainly in, a, in my elected career, which is spans about 27 years, this is the first time we've seen housing and homeless, homelessness basically tied um, for number one in those kind of surveys. And, and in most surveys, uh, I'm sure um, later uh, Carl Guardino can affirm that, uh, but not, not only up there at t on top, but essentially skyrocketing uh, beyond issues that are, you know, the bread and butter for all of our communities and neighborhoods, whether they be education, uh, environment, and open space, and, and public safety in general. So that said, um, let's let me try to answer uh, the question again as best I can. It's occurred to me um, going back. Uh, 17 or 18 years uh, to 2001 when I joined ABAG. I later served as president uh, of ABAG. Um, and then in 2007, joined the MTC. So I've served concurrently at both those agencies since then. Uh, that um, the issues of, of transportation and housing um, were dealing, or have been historically here for forever, basically. Um, up until just recently, they're still delinked significantly from a public policy standpoint, uh, but have been delinked even from a planning standpoint. Even institutionally, we had essentially created this system that basically didn't exist anywhere in the United States of America, where you have a separate uh, housing agency planning for the Bay Area and a, a separate MPO that's doing basically nothing but transportation, uh, infrastructure planning and implementation. Uh, I, I realized before I got an MTC that uh, uh, that wasn't a healthy situation and, and tried to push toward some sort of consolidation uh, of the two agencies. It wasn't until I became uh, the chair, the two-year chair of, 
of MTC, um, when I sat down with then Executive Director Steve Heminger, uh, who wanted to know what my priorities, plural, were uh, for my next two years, and, and to his credit, you know, for those of you who, who feel those maybe are very, very staff-driven organizations, um, perhaps some truth there, uh, to some degree, but my experience has been uh, that from a public policy standpoint, uh, the, the executive directors of those organizations have turned to their policymakers and said, what do you feel needs to be the priorities here? And that's exactly what happened. I said, I don't have priorities, plural. I have one priority, and, and that's to, to merge or consolidate ABAG and MTC, to pull planning and transportation housing together with one single unified mega uh, staff, planning staff, that informs all the elected officials here in 101 cities, in nine counties and, and those from Caltrans, uh, Bijan Sertipi used to be my seatmate at MTC. We all need to be um, in, uh, being informed in, in a singular way because it's a singular issue in reality. It's, it's not a bilateral issue. Uh, so um, that alliance was created and I think it's working. Someone asked me uh, just in the last 24 hours how well I think it's working. I think it's, it's a work in progress, but by and large, uh, it's, it's working very well. This, the issue, there's other underlying issues, though, besides just planning, right? Um, my experience as, as uh, a, a vice mayor in a big city, uh, as a county supervisor, um, tells me, informs me that just the, the synchronization of, of the build-out of transportation facilities and housing has always been an issue. I'll just give you one very basic example. When I was on the San Jose City Council, in the spirit of MTC's Resolution 3434 and what probably most people in here believe, when we saw the light rail uh, coming down what's called the Capitol Corridor in North San Jose, which would ultimately uh, end up at Tasman and Santa Clara and what's now Levi Stadium and so forth, we said we need to sweeping, sweepingly, if that's a word, Regeneral plan that corridor to 100 units to an acre. It was about six to eight to the acre. We did that. We did that then. I've been on the board of supervisors now for 10 and a half years. You can drive down that corridor and you won't see 100 units to the acre. And that's not to blame anyone who succeeded me on the city council. That job was done. The planning piece was done. But what do we need in terms of, of incentives? Is it tax incentives? Uh, are, are, are there other... Uh, economic uh, needs that we have. There was a time when you could, before the Reagan Tax Reform Act, when tax exempt bond financing would have been available for those kinds of projects. Um, it's no longer the case, so we need to look at that, and we only have so much ability at the regional and state level to bring to bear those kind of incentives. So you go to transportation money and say, will that help? You know, does that help create some incentive you know, to, to bring, uh, the, bring into alignment um, you know, not just the planning, but the actual implementation. And we all know that the other side of the coin is, is a problem too, because, you know, it's, it's, it is literally the other, the other side of the coin. We get housing projects that are approved based on the anticipation of, of rail or transit improvements uh, that are then uh, essentially um, delayed or, or struggle to get off the ground because of the erratic nature of transportation funding. And this creates this tension at the regional level among good elected officials, I think, I'm pointing myself and my colleagues who say, do you really want to take transportation funding and use it as an incentive for housing when we struggle to have enough consistent transportation funding in the first place for the transportation that's going to trigger those very housing developments? So we've got to work through that. I know I have a limited amount of, of time uh, to continue at, at this point. But I just want to say one last thing that I don't want to lose sight of, and hopefully this kind of dialogue will also keep this larger issue up in the air. AB 32, SB 375 set this whole region on a different course in every region in California, saying that what all this needs to be about now is GHG reduction, okay? Yeah, we need, we need to do a lot of things that make our communities more livable but 60% of our GHG problems are coming from emissions. And if we don't have a regional plan that reduces vehicle miles traveled, that does workforce proximity, that, that starts to tackle those issues, um, 
we're doomed. That's not an overstatement. And, and people like Senator Scott Weiner, I don't think get enough credit, who, who was also a seatmate of mine at MTC, for what he's really after. As he's looking at Plan Bay Area and saying, this is a house of cards. This, we are doomed if, if we're gonna say that we have a plan here that produces housing in proximity to, to, to workforce and reduces GHG, but in fact, at, at the local level, that housing production never happens. He's really making an environmental argument, and he doesn't get enough credit for that, in my opinion. He's, he's gotten criticized uh, in a number of ways about local control and everything else, but he's had the courage to step up and say, I'm not gonna let my environment in, this glo in, in the global uh, environment go down the tubes because we can't figure out how to produce housing aligned with how our own plans say we're gonna produce it. And I think we need to keep talking about that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Let's now hear from the transit agency perspective. Abby Thorne Lyman is the program manager for transit oriented development at BART. She provides policy, direction, and strategic oversight of housing and commercial development on BART's 250 acre wow. real estate portfolio. Okay. Abby. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. It's such an honor to be on the stage with so many leaders in this niche field of the intersection of housing and transportation. And um, I consider it my responsibility as an employee of BART to bang on those cylinders of excellence for housing and transportation and try to knock down that cylinder wall. And um, sometimes I actually feel more like a translator, you know, because I'm having to explain tax credits to somebody who's run a transit agency or, or explain, um, you know, BART's maintenance and operational needs to Pedro, so who, who kindly takes it from me. So I just want to start by, by acknowledging again the impact that transportation has had on communities. And I think there's really few better examples than where we're sitting today in downtown San Francisco. It's hard to imagine what this city would be like if we hadn't started that construction on Market Street 50 years ago. Um, how would, how would we be moving those 28,000 people an hour in at the morning rush hour? I just, um, well, the, the reality is we wouldn't. We wouldn't be moving an additional, that we would not have as many jobs in downtown San Francisco. Um, two thirds of BART's trips began or end on Market Street. We are obviously a very much a hub and spoke kind of agency. Um, we, we, we feed people from, primarily from the East Bay to the West Bay. We're trying to feed more, pe more people from the West Bay to the East Bay and very, very soon to the South Bay and to San Jose, which is very exciting for us. Um, but I think part of the reason that BART has had this, um, this, this program uh, in place, this transit-oriented development program since the early 1990s, is actually because of the impact that BART has had on, on the communities in the East Bay and the impact that those communities have had on BART to be very realistic. So BART has a dozen transit-oriented development projects that are under construction or have been completed around stations, and you can see those in the, in the examples like the Fruitvale Transit Village or the Contra Costa Center at Pleasant Hill. Um, uh, you can see how those areas have been transformed by development on BART's property. But the reality is that BART has actually has had an impact on communities that seemingly appear unchanged since BART opened 45, to 50 years ago, uh, like North Berkeley, or Concord, or Hayward, where um, the mobility patterns of the residents who are living in those neighborhoods have vastly changed. Uh, a, a household that lives within a half a mile of a BART station is twice as likely to walk, bike, and take transit to work, and half as likely to own two cars in their family. And that is really the performance that we're talking about. It's the greenhouse gas reduction that we're talking about. And that's why BART actually started to care about this issue and started to focus on developing housing on its own property at its stations was really because BART is about ridership. It's a very ridership driven agency. We have one of the highest fare box recovery rates in the United States that hovers between 60 and 80% of our operating costs covered by our riders. And so we, we, need, we need riders to continue to ride BART. Um, and um, I, I think one of the points of criticism we hear a lot, especially is this particular issue of concentrating housing near transit that comes up again and again is BART should not be in the real estate business. Why is BART in the real estate business? I hear it all the time. But so much of how BART runs relates to what's happening in our communities and our housing crisis. When we opened the Antioch extension um, a little over a year ago, the parking lot at that station 
started to fill up almost immediately by 6.30 in the morning. These are residents who are coming, driving from the Central Valley, driving from far east Contra Costa County, trying to find a better way to get to work to do that mega commute, and they're finding themselves at BART, and they get to the BART station at 6.30 in the morning, and I myself have done some of the morning service going out at Pittsburgh, and it's amazing to see people getting off, the, getting off these buses at 4.30 in the morning when I thought I was there early. They'd started their commute probably an hour before. We just saw the, the homelessness counts come out, um, for uh, the, the, the biannual homeless counts were up um, 30%, a little bit more than 30% in Alameda County over two years ago, and, and over 40% in Contra Costa County, and I believe similar numbers for Santa Clara County. It was somewhere in the 30% range. Um, and, we're, and, and keep in mind that while um, there are a lot of the homeless um, there are a lot of homeless shelters on the East Coast. Most of homeless people in California are unsheltered. And so BART offers folks a place where they can be warm and stay, but, I, but we also obviously receive a lot of compl complaints about, um, about, hom about the homeless riding on the trains and um, uh, folks fearing for their safety. And these are all directly related issues. Homelessness counts are up because we're in a housing crisis and people cannot afford to live here. And so they're, they're staying here and they're living on the streets. And if we are not part of the solution, then, what, then we're just merely reactive. And I think what we've learned over the last 50 years of BART's history is that we have the ability to shape communities, communities have the ability to shape us, and so we need to be more proactive in trying to help shape those trends the way we want them to go versus reactive. So in 2016, um, the BART board set new goals related to transit-oriented development, and Pedro talked about those a little bit, the 20,000 units on BART's property by 2040, but also 4.5 million square feet of office space, because what we're trying to do is make BART less of a hub-and-spoke uh, system and much more so uh, having a balanced ridership base that's also going to the East Bay. Um, and uh, BART partly adopted these performance targets um, because our communities, while well, we are not a housing agency and we are not a community development agency, our communities are in that business, our partner communities. And if we are not making the best use of our land at our stations to help those communities, then we're not doing our part to be a good partner. So. Um, so we felt it was very important to set production goals, to set performance-driven goals around greenhouse gas emissions and in reducing vehicle miles traveled, to help be part of the solution towards implementing SB 375, um, and to help cities that were really struggling with the loss of redevelopment and other, um, and other funding. So um, in response to that, um, as, as, as Pedro mentioned, N NPH uh, sponsored this bill, Assembly Bill 2923, which Assembly members um, David Chu and Timothy Grayson uh, co-authored. And we are now in the position of, of implementing this bill that gave BART a bit of higher land, of, of land use authority for our properties around our stations in Alameda, Contra Costa, and San Francisco counties. Obviously, this is an extremely controversial um, issue, uh, the issue of taking authority away from local governments, and our board, our board of elected officials, was playing out that very debate in the boardroom. Um, and so, um, but what we've decided to do, that was a bill that was really just pushing and urging BART to, um, to really move into faster production of housing on our land. And rather than looking at it as just a zoning bill, it's a production bill. So what we did was we reached out to all 22 communities that would be affected by this bill. And we actually found that of those 22 communities, well over a dozen communities are interested in BART advancing development on, their prop on our property within the next five years. So we have the interest there. We have the willing partners. I think where we go from here is about willing partnerships. It's about working with our communities and supporting the, the production of the housing that they need to build on our property. Thank you. Okay, finally, we're going to hear from Carl Guardino, President and CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, a public policy trade association that represents 350 of Silicon Valley's most respected employers. And even more importantly, he's been appointed to his fourth term as a commissioner for the California Transportation Commission earlier this year by Governor Newsom. As a housing advocate, he co-created the Housing Trust, excuse me, the Housing Trust Silicon Valley, which has helped 30,000 people afford homes in high-cost Silicon Valley. Let's hear about the private perspective. 
Karen Philbrook, thank you. And it's an honor to be here with the Commonwealth Club to talk about the intersection of transportation and housing. My theme for today is we in the Bay Area need to be bolder to move boulders. <laughs> Let's invest 90 seconds on framing the obstacles and six and a half minutes on the opportunities to address those obstacles. Housing obstacles, 1989. That is the last year in which California has consistently met its annual housing production numbers to match our population. Three decades of neglect, 3.5 million homes short of that balance that we need. Supply, demand, economics 101, that is why after three decades we have the crisis that we have. 3.5 million is more than the other 49 states combined. Transportation. After housing affordability and homelessness, traffic and transportation is the top concern of our Bay Area's nearly 8 million residents. Average commute times have grown 21% between 2010 and 2017 as people are traveling further and further from their jobs because of the lack of home affordability with our daily average commute now 73 minutes round trip. Depressed? Those are the obstacles, the boulders. So let's switch from depressed to determined and replace obstacles with opportunities. And when it comes to the intersection between housing and transportation, we can be bolder to replace boulders. Three quick lessons learned, and there'll be a fourth lesson just for free if we have time. <laughs> lesson number one, take a walk or take a risk. Karen mentioned kindly that we created Housing Trust Silicon Valley nearly 20 years ago. The initial goal raised 20 million in voluntary contributions, leveraged 200 million in private development, initially assist 4,800 families, primarily loans rather than grants, continue to replenish those funds. Well, we were wrong. We didn't raise 20 million. We've now raised 250 million. We didn't leverage 200 million. We've now leveraged nearly 3 billion. And as Karen mentioned, we've helped nearly 30,000 individuals and families. But here's the story. When we took that risk to create the Housing Trust, a member company representative of the leadership group, not the CEO visionary level, somewhere further down in the food chain said, this will be the greatest failure in the history of the Silicon Valley leadership group. We took the risk anyway, and this is what we have. Mayor Sam Licardo in San Jose is taking a risk around ADUs. I hate that term. I prefer cottages. He wants to bend the cost curve and build a cottage industry of people having homes on their properties. Supervisor Cortese with Mayor Licardo in 2015 took a risk and said, we're going to end veterans' homelessness in Silicon Valley. It was 704 veterans at the time. They've helped over 900 veterans. That population has grown with the ongoing crisis, but they are bending the curve. So my question, what's the risk you're taking to help us address housing and homelessness? Lesson two, be a voice for the voiceless. And this is housing advocacy. We need policies. We've heard of some of them. We support everyone that's been mentioned. But we also need programs and developments. So one of the steps we take based on criteria that we're not just building homes, we're building better communities linked to transit, which is also what we did with the Housing Trust, we actually, at the leadership group, go out and advocate for homes affordable to families along all price points. More than 300 developments endorsed. My team and I are out at hearings on average one to two nights a week before planning commissions and city councils till one, two, three in the morning. We've been successful almost every time because we're being the voice for the voiceless. But here's the risk and the challenge to be that voice. I have been chased out into parking lots, received death threats. Female members of my staff have been followed into women's restrooms to be accosted and attacked. This is not for the faint of heart. 
but for people with a heart for others in our communities who are struggling to survive and thrive. The third lesson, listen, learn, and then lead. January 2017, our friends at SPUR, the Bay Area Council, and the leadership group came together. Why? November of 2016, Los Angeles passed a transportation sales tax measure permanent. For, in the first 40 years, it will generate $120 billion in improvements. Same election, Seattle passed a measure, $45 billion. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to make Bay Area residents gulp. We have to learn from Los Angeles. Okay, you gulped. Get over yourselves and let's move forward. When Los Angeles now goes to D.C., they can say, look at the matching funds we have as a region. We cannot do that as a region. Now, the leadership group has been proud to lead or co-lead six successful transportation countywide funding measures over the last 30 years, 30 billion in improvements. We were pleased with Spur and the Bay Area Council to lead in June of 2018, something that Supervisor Cortesi and the MTC kindly helped lead and place on the ballot, Regional Measure 3, the first nine-county transportation measure in the history of our Bay Area. And while that was a good beta test, in its first 25 years, it's only going to generate $4.45 billion. The regional funds for 35 incredibly necessary transit, and transportation investments. But that only goes so far. We need to be bolder, as I mentioned in my theme, and we need to listen, learn, and lead in order to do so. So since 2017, we've been meeting. The legislature said, put that bigger goal on freeze. Let's start with regional measure three. It'll be our beta test. Well, now we're back with an initiative called Faster Bay Area. And the listening before we lead is we're meeting with 40 transportation professionals, the CMAs, the fixed train operators, all of the transit agencies in the region, along with MTC, Caltrans, Caltrain, and the others. We need to learn from the technical experts because here's the question the leadership group wants to answer if we're going to do any other big measure that represents a regional economy with regional commute patterns. Here's the question. The Bay Area deserves a regional transit system that's world-class, seamless, integrated, that will better serve the transit dependent while luring those of us who are not transit dependent out of our cars. If that is the vision, then what do we need to do that's worth reaching into our own wallets rather than our neighbor's wallets? And I owe you 14 seconds. We'll go to question and answer. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I think my big takeaway is to listen, learn, lead, and be bold to move boulders. Yeah. Awesome, Carl. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's get started on our questions. And boy, do we have some good ones. To the panelists, because we have so many, may I respectfully request that you keep your responses brief. Our first question is for you, Carl. Hmm? Google has pledged $1 billion. Is there a better way for tech companies that have benefited from recent tax breaks to give back or contribute to the Bay Area's housing crisis, to which they and many other tech companies are responsible to exasperating this crisis? Thank you for whoever asked that question. I'm going to bend that just a little bit, and I'm going to address it directly as well. Jobs for hardworking families and individuals in our region and state is not the problem. Not building homes is the problem. Mm -hmm. Remember, 1989, since we've consistently met that need, 3.5 million homes short. The problem isn't because, fortunately, we're creating jobs. How many people working here would like to be unemployed? I remember 2002 through 2002, the dot-com bus. 119,000 people lost their jobs. The, the problems that created. It took six years to get those jobs back. Similar in 20, uh, 2008 through 2010, even more job losses with the steepest and deepest economic decline we've ever seen. 
So let's create jobs, but let's make sure that we're providing hardworking local elected officials with the support they need to press the green button rather than the red when an affordable home development comes before them, especially a transit-oriented affordable home development. So let me brag about Google. We had foreknowledge that that was going to happen. A billion-dollar investment is amazing. But think about it. It takes, in San Jose, as Supervisor Cortese could attest, nearly $750,000 to build an affordable home. It's over a million in San Francisco. We have to bend that cost curve because as generous as that is with their corporate funds, that's only 20,000 new homes. So we have to do much more. And then it was around, I think there was part of that around Google growing in the Diridon Station, the Rod Diridon Station in San Jose. For those of us who are nuts about transit-oriented development and kind of geeky, that's the most exciting thing I've seen in a long time. Placing 20,000 jobs at a company like Google that wants to make that integrated into the community with housing as well at all price points. When we have a station that currently has Caltrain, Light Rail, Altamont Commuter Express, Amtrak, Capital Corridors, buses, express buses, and shuttle buses. By 2026, we'll have BART. Hopefully, by 2027, we'll have high speed rail. That is exactly what we've been advocating for. So, high five to companies like Google's that are stepping, that Google like are stepping forward. Virtual high five. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, Supervisor Cortese, how do we develop political will to pass tenant protections? That's good. Um, <laughs> An easy one. <laughs> great question. I mean, we've seen, we've seen a lot more political will or willingness, I think, at the local level uh, in, in recent years particularly uh, to put certain tenant protections uh, in place, um, you know, whether it's just cause or expansion of rent control or whatever. I, that obviously, at the legislative level, there's been a lot more resistance, um, uh, even at the ballot box, you know, in terms of overturning cost to Hawkins. So I, I think that um, right now, you know, really for the first time, again, in, in my recollection, uh, we've got um, such an array of housing bills uh, in the legislature that it, 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 it's very, very important, um, I think, for the legislature to take a surgical approach and not do what we elected officials have a tendency to do on a wholesale level so much is instead of being surgical and thoughtful about how we're going to do these things, use a meat cleaver and end up making you know, things worse or creating resistance and, and referendums that come back to overturn you know, everything that the legislature is trying to do. So um, I, I do think there's plenty of tools is what I'm saying in the couple hundred bills that are in the legislature right now. Um, but uh, our legislature needs to choose wisely and make sure that we're, we're actually uh, making progress. I think the idea that we can get away without tenant protections while we're in this crisis um, is wrong. You know, th that train left the station and, and now we need to just be very thoughtful about what we're putting into place. Thank you. Lori. The disabled and mobility impaired rider on public transit are not well looked after, combined with broken escalators and rough roads impacting bus riding comfort. Compared to Japan, infrastructure maintenance is poor in the U.S. What can we do about this? So yes, infrastructure maintenance is poor in the U.S. and that's a reflection of what we've invested in it. We are working um, with transit companies to, to purchase uh, large numbers of, of uh, buses and trains um, that's used throughout the state and we're looking, of course, at making sure that that's easy to get on and off. Um, what was the rest of the question? Uh, rough roads, we have a poor infrastructure compared okay. to Japan. Got it. Um, so, <laughs> rough roads, yes. We do have rough roads. We also have Senate Bill 1, yes. which is helping us to address those rough roads. I had a discussion yesterday with somebody that said, we're not moving fast enough. We're not. We've had generations of not just underinvestment, but really lack of investment in our transportation system. And so we did not have the funding to even develop projects, so when the money came along, it would be there. So we've gotten a lot of projects out, over, over 100 out. We've got 400 that we'll be putting out over the next year. We are um, 
almost doubling the investment next year that we had this year. It takes time to develop the project. Uh, the, the easy stuff we're st we've started to work on. The harder stuff um, is going to take a little longer to get out. We've, we've used a Band-Aid approach for years of just doing the minimum to keep the system running. We're changing the way we think about our uh, maintenance, that we're not using a Band-Aid approach. We're actually looking at doing the bigger long-term fixes so you don't see us out there all the time. So give us time, and we will continue to work with, um, with the grant programs for funding uh, transit agencies as well. Okay, thank you. Abby, how are you assessing how well TOD strategies are working? Yeah, um, we are uh, in, the midst, in the midst of actually completing a survey of households who are living in developments near our stations to understand a little bit more about how they actually move. Um, this is a longitudinal study that is building on work that um, Dr. Robert Cervero completed mm -hmm. um, back in 2004. So it has been a while. It is hard to get the funding to do a survey like this. Um, but one of the hints of, of research, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the findings that came out of that 2004 study was actually um, that the residents of TOD, um, oh, sorry, um, that the residents of TOD actually tend to get on BART later in the day. Mm -hmm. So that is something that in 2004 did not really matter to BART. Matters ex a whole lot today. So that's something we're actually trying to tease out right now is not just how much people take BART, but when they're getting on the system. Thank you. Pedro, Senate Bill 50. The measure that would overhaul zoning rules to allow higher density housing in some neighborhoods has been strongly opposed by some and defeated twice in the last two years in Sacramento. One, what is happening? And two, should SB 50 include substantial money for transportation? That's an, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. Um, when, so one distinction that I want to make is SB 50 and its predecessor, SB 827. SB 50 is a product of one year of conversation with stakeholders from across the political spectrum to address the deficiencies that were found in 827. 827 initially did not include many of the affordability protections, tenant protections that SB 50 featured. And so, um, so first there was 827, it was defeated. SB 50 came along, um, had widespread support from labor, affordable housing groups, um, the business community, the realtors, and it brought together a number of political forces that at 8 to 7 simply did not have. And we were well on our way to getting a deal on its final affordability levels and tenant protections before the bill was shelved and made into a two-year bill. Um, as far as the funding for transportation goes in the SB 50, that bill was simply trying to address the zoning side of the issue and not so much the transportation funding. And that is a critical question. I think that had that bill passed this year, we would see much more demand for transit. And in that would place additional burdens on our existing infrastructure and we would have to have that conversation as a state around what that means. Um, I think with the, with the new investment that we have through SB1, we would likely continue to have that conversation from that route, but also looking to see well, what are voters willing to support. Um, so I would say that um, with SB50 being made into a two-year bill, the conversations are very much ongoing, and we are committed to continue to work on it to truly make it the best bill that it can possibly be when it comes up again in January. Okay. May I be... Potentially controversial with one sentence. I would love it. The Silicon Valley Leadership Group uh, actually co-sponsored Senate Bill 827, which was the earlier iteration of Senate Bill 50, and were strong supporters of SB 50. And we often hear from well-meaning local elected officials their concern about losing local control. And with all respect, with local re control comes local responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when we are appropriately providing jobs that people need to support their families, earn a living, and have the meaning that a job can provide, they also, those jobs need a place to go home to sleep at night. That's right. And in the Bay Area and throughout California, we have not lived up to the needs of those hardworking families. I have three young kids. I adore them. 
when they grow up, I want them to be able to afford to live in the community in which we've raised them, but I don't love them so much that I want them to stay in my house forever. <laughs> and that's currently the only choice they have, and we need to change that. Absolutely. The idea of my little Charlie staying with me till she's 30 is pretty okay with me. <laughs> um, <coughs> fortunately, we've reached the time in the program where we only have one more question that can be asked. It's a good one. Lori. Let's see. Part of California's housing crisis also includes the rising homeless population. About one-fifth of the nation's homeless are said to reside in California. This includes many encampments on Caltrans property and right-of-way. In what way is Caltrans managing this challenge? So this is a huge challenge um, for a transportation agency to be dealing so frequently every day with homelessness and homeless encampments in our right-of-way. So there's several, several ways we're approaching this. One is we, we continue to try and clean, clean it up. Um, our right-of-way is no place for people to be living. It's, um, it's dangerous. You're next to moving cars. Um, aside from that, there's other things we're doing, though, and, and I really applaud the Bay Area. I deal with, you know, statewide, but the Bay Area, we, in San Francisco, we've partnered on the navigation centers where for a dollar a year, San, the city of San Francisco is leasing our right-of-way um, where it's safe uh, for navigation centers. And I was at one of the uh, ribbon cuttings, and there was a woman there who had been helped by it. You come in, you get help, you bring your pet, you bring whatever you have. I, there's very little restrictions. Um, so things like that in San Jose, I think we've got, I'm sorry, I, confu I always confuse all of the different programs, but we've got other programs throughout San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco, where we are partnering. You can build um, um, small housing and, and stuff like that. We are also have a program that we never talk about, but I think is really good. Um, at Caltrans, we work with some of the prisons to hire prisoners as they are released to come and work on our maintenance crews. Because, yeah, go ahead and clap right. for that. Because that's when you're extremely vulnerable is coming out of prison and you don't have a job and you don't have a place to live. And the recidivism rate, I wish I had the numbers, it's extremely low if you've been able to come and get a job with us. So that's another great program that not a lot of people know about. We also have a separate program with parolees and, a, and another company where we hire that company, they bring parolees in, learn how to do work in our right of way, again, give people a job so we don't have this issue of people camping in our right of way. We have another, other programs with the city of San Jose, with the business community, um, and I think you, San Jose has the, the anyway, bring people in, homeless people in, to clean up our right-of-way. So those are some of the more proactive things we're doing. Additionally, the governor has asked all state agencies to look at what excess land do we have that can be converted into housing. And we are looking at, as every other state agency is, we are looking at all of our right-of-way and looking at um, what opportunities are there. And I've asked my team to go a little further, and we'll see how it works out. None of this is going to happen overnight. But we have some locations where we have facilities that maybe are close to transit-oriented or would make better transit-oriented development than um, what it's used for today. And so we're, we're trying to take a more creative look at where, where can we give up land or maybe we can move to a different location, what would be better for housing. Um, I think we have some opportunities to really make a difference so that our main focus is not just this continuous cleanup of homeless encampments. Thank you, and thank you to all of our panelists for today. I'm disappointed that we've come to the end of our program because the dialogue is rich and there are many more questions. Um, for those of you that did not have your question asked, I apologize, but please come to the front and see if you can spend a few time, a little bit of time with our speakers. Thank you again to our featured speaker, Dr. Asha weinstein Agaral, Lori Berman, Pedro Galveo, Dave Cortese, Abby, Th Abby Thorne Lyman, and Carl Guardino. We appreciate your time and your expertise very, very much. And thank you earlier to our keynote speaker, the Honorable Therese McMillan, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and a very warm thank you to Secretary Norman Wymanetta. We also thank our audiences here and on radio, television, and the internet. Today's program has been sponsored by the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. I'm Dr. Karen Philbrick, 
And this concludes today's program at the Commonwealth Club, the place where you are in the know. Thank you.